Welcome back to Ramblings of a Math Woman, a podcast where I talk about whatever shiny object happens to catch my attention for the week. So far with these episodes, I've only gone over things that I either come across by accident recently or things that I read a while ago but started thinking about again out of nowhere. So the topics came to me organically is what I'm trying to say. But this time, I'm kind of intentionally hopping on this whole Netflix bandwagon and the Queen's Gambit slash chess craze. Because if there's one thing that mad people are known for, that's being on top of all the current trends. Now, what I want to talk about isn't directly about the Netflix show per se. It is more of the related topic of chess. I figured this would be a good one to cover now, considering that the phrase how to play chess has been a number one search in Google for like the past two or three weeks. And eBay has had a record number of searches for chessboards. I'm thinking if I'm ever going to talk about this, now's the time. And while chess is definitely an interesting topic in its own right, as far as sciencey things go, there's another underlying theme in this one that is very interesting to look into as well. So this episode is a bit of a two for one, if you will. And having said that, The thing that I want to talk about today is the story of the Polgar sisters. In case you haven't heard of them, they are these three Hungarian sisters, Susan, Judith, and Sophia, that absolutely shattered the glass ceiling of the chess playing world and really paved the path for other women players that came after them. Because back then, and honestly even kind of now, chess was mostly considered to be a game for men, and not a lot of women were playing. But before I get into that whole story, the craziest part doesn't even begin with them. It actually starts with their father, Laszlo Polgar, before the sisters were even born. So Laszlo was an educational psychologist by profession, and during his research, he was fascinated with individuals that were considered to be geniuses. And by geniuses, I mean that in a sense where they were near the top of their respective fields. He studied and published papers on child prodigies and even evaluated the lives of people such as Einstein and Socrates and anyone else that was considered to have the highest of intellect. He observed individuals that were at the top of their fields and he tried to understand what was the thing that gave them that edge. Like, what made them the best at what they do over everybody else? And while he was doing this research, there appeared to be a common pattern in many of his subjects. And that was that they, A, started really young, and B, that they spent a lot of time practicing their craft. From what he noticed, there didn't even seem to be a familiar component to their geniuses. And by that, I mean, there wasn't a strong pattern of every child prodigy came from parents that were also excelling in that field. So from these studies, he came to a conclusion that a genius is raised rather than born, meaning If you train a child in something at a sufficiently young age, then they will grow up to be masters of their craft. According to him, he was making a case for nurture rather than nature when it came to the development of an individual. He even wrote a book on this hypothesis that gets roughly translated to bring up genius, which I I think the title could have been translated a bit better because it's a little fobby now, but that's neither here nor there. Now, as with most scientific research, observation is great, but it's always preferable if you can do your own control experiment to find out if your observation actually holds water. So, as it usually goes with people passionate about their projects, Laszlo wanted to perform his own experiments and see if his findings are actually accurate. So, he wanted to raise a genius himself. And he presented this idea, and naturally he was called crazy, and the local government even suggested that he go seek help from a psychologist, but when has that ever stopped a scientist, am I right? And it's funny because when I first heard about this story, before I even had a chance to actually read about the details, we were talking about this part, and I made a joke like, oh, it would be so funny if he and his partner didn't even want a kid, but then he decided he wants to do this experiment, and they just said like, oh well, I guess we'll make one. And I guess the universe heard me and said, hold my beer, because what actually happened is even weirder than that. Life really is stranger than fiction. As it turns out, Laszlo wasn't only not married, but he didn't even have a girlfriend or another counterpart that he would need for human making. So before he even started his experiment on trying to bring up a genius, he first had to get someone that was on board with this idea in the first place to join in. Like... He had to convince a woman to have a kid with him for the sake of performing a developmental study. 
I feel like I went to school with people that I can imagine doing this, but I still can't imagine anyone doing this, you know? Anyways, he began his courtship, and I use the term in the loosest sense, and he approached women that he thought would be decent candidates for this and apparently got rejected a few times, if you can imagine that, before he finally wrote a letter to a Ukrainian foreign language teacher named Clara, and she actually agreed. And this really does go to show that there's someone out there for everyone because, oh boy. She moved to Hungary to be with him, and in 1969, they had their first daughter, Susan. And thus, the experiment begins. And for any of you that ever made fun of online dating because it's not organic or natural, just trust me, things can always get weirder. Now, according to all the articles that I read, they didn't even have a game plan for how they were going to approach this research exactly before they had their first kid. So they toyed with a lot of options. They knew for sure they wanted to teach their kids multiple languages, and I'm assuming that was because of Clara's profession, so their one was kind of a gimme. And they also wanted to make sure to include advanced math as an important subject. But chess itself was never really a part of the plan. They said that they ended up choosing it because when Susan was very young, like maybe younger than four, she found a chessboard and got enamored by the pieces. She said she saw them as toys, and after Laszlo showed her the basics of the game, she got really into it. Clara and Laszlo decided from here that chess was the ideal skill they could use in order to prove his theory, because unlike other skills that they considered before, such as art or music or acting, where the skills shown by these prodigies can be subjective and up for debate, chess had a very clear set of rules and was complicated enough where the strategy really mattered. And in the end, there was a clear winner. So there was very little gray area or room for debate about whether or not the person was good. So as far as proving a theory goes, this was perfect because you can assign an actual rank to the player. And so the training began at the age of four. And Susan actually started making waves in the chess world really early on. At the beginning, when she was still four years old, she won her first tournament called Girls Under 11 Chess Tournament with a score of 10 to 0. And at the age of 12, she won World Under 16 Girls Championship, which is fine and impressive. But by the age of 15, she became the top-ranked female chess player in the world. Now, like I said before, there weren't that many women playing to begin with at this time, so maybe being called best in the world out of women doesn't tell you a lot. But luckily, the rest of her career does more than enough to distinguish her as just being the best out of a small pool of individuals. Like, for example, despite this gender barrier, by the age of 17, she became the first woman to qualify for the men's world championship cycle. In October 2005, she was ranked as the second best female player in the world, and she held the rank of 2,577, which, when I first read it, doesn't sound that high, but considering how many chess players there are, this was actually really good. So that was a bit of summary for the oldest sister. Now, Sophia was the Polgar's second daughter, and she was born in 1974, and they just kept up the same chess team for her and then for their third daughter, um, Judith, since this was the most accurate way to prove their hypothesis, which is keep replicating the results. So Sophia followed suit, and at the age of 14, was said to have stunned the chess world by her performance during a tournament in Rome, where she won by beating several grandmasters with a score of 8.5 out of 9. Her performance rating in that tournament is one of the strongest performance rating in chess history ever. Like, in the top five for both male and female. And as a result, this tournament became known as the Sacking of Rome. Again, she was 14. I honestly can't remember what I was doing at this age, but I can say with confidence that I was definitely not sacking any countries and nobody remembers me for it. One of her biggest accomplishments, according to chess journals, was her match against Victor Korknoy, who was a 10-time candidate for the World Championship. So, he was one of the top players. Sophia beat him when she was 28 years old, and after the game, Victor famously said that this was, and I quote, the very first and the very last game that she would win against him. He has never played her since, so I guess that's one way to make that true. And now we're down to the youngest sister, Judith, who is considered to be the best player out of all three. Remember how I said that Susan was the second highest ranked female player? Well, Judith is the first. 
Even though she started competing at an extremely young age, she drew the most attention when she was nine, where she played five competitors simultaneously and won each match. You think that's crazy? Give me a second. The biggest kicker out of that story isn't that she only played against five opponents at the same time, is that she was doing it blindfolded. And this is a thing in chess, like where a player is so good that they don't even have to look at the board and they just kind of know where everything starts and their opponent tells them where they moved. And the individual is able to keep this entire board in the head and their pieces, how they're moving and keep track of everything that they will just tell their opponent where to move their piece and they will just know where everything is. This is difficult enough to do with one game going. Just imagine doing it with five by a nine-year-old. Like, that's crazy, right? It's not just me. It's crazy. While Judith was doing all this and competing and gaining the attention of the public, a well-known chess player at the time, Gary Kasparov, said during an interview, and again, I quote, She has fantastic chess talent, but she is, after all, a woman. It all comes down to the imperfections of the female psyche. No woman can sustain a prolonged battle. End quote. Well, in 2002, Judith made him eat his words and beat Kasparov in a match, and he walked away from the table pretty upset. However, it seemed that after that experience, he changed his opinion about the effects of gender on chess, and the same was the case for several other male members of these groups who were before convinced that women didn't have the mental capacity to excel in the game. Judith has gone to defeat several world champions in her career and win countless trophies, and some of the records that she set remain intact to this day. So, they have yet to be broken by anyone. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview on the sisters' records and their chess-playing history. Before I started reading about this, I didn't think I would want to say more than a couple of sentences on this entire chess history altogether. Because, I mean, how interesting could it possibly be to have someone just read off a bunch of chess sources to you? I mean, I like chess as much as the next guy, but I don't know, I would click off so fast. But these stories are actually legitimately interesting, I think, and the more I started reading about them, the more I wanted to include the details. I guess it's also good that I did, because I think these are the little factors that compound in a study, and after you step away, you get to see the pattern and the big picture. And from this, the second interesting part of this story unfolds which is the research that the parents performed and the results themselves. Now, I've never heard of this study before myself, but it turns out that this isn't some random, unknown study in the world of psychology that I stumbled upon by accident. It's actually considered to be one of the strongest proofs for the part that practice plays in the outcome of skill sets versus just genetics, and is cited quite frequently by people who study developmental psychology. And before you say that the girls probably inherited some chess grandmaster gene from their parents, I'll point out that neither Laszlo nor Clara were particularly good at chess. Judith actually started winning games against her dad by the age of five. So whatever his skill set was, it was enough to teach them how to play, and from there, it was just them practicing. Even if there was some recessive gene that existed that could have potentially been passed on, the probability that a recessive gene gets expressed in three out of three children is extremely unlikely. To even add to that, while the sisters were first learning to play chess as kids, Susan recalls that Judith was considered to have the least talent out of all three. She said that Judith just didn't pick things up as fast as Sophia and she did, but she also said that Judith put in the most effort into practice. So, short term, this meant that Judith didn't win as many competitions as early on as her sisters, but long term, it ended up paying off where she surpassed them in both skill and rank. Because of all of these facts put together, Laszlo ended up confirming his 50-year-old theory that practice beats talent. And if you spend enough time and effort to achieve mastery, you can reach the peak. You don't need an innate ability to do it. Now, they can be obvious critiques of this study, like the sample is too small, not diversified enough, there's no control group, and so on and so on. I know how science and study and research works, okay? Trust me. Like, for example, personally, if I were the parents and I wanted to make a stronger case, I would have maybe adopted three kids and seen if I could make all six of them into grandmasters, and therefore completely eliminating the possibility that someone might blame it on inherited genes. Now, before you say that I'm crazy for suggesting that someone adopt kids for the sake of an experiment, 
I'll remind you that it's only slightly less crazy than proposing to someone you just met and asking if they have kids so you can run psychological tests on them. So, you know, don't judge me too harshly. But even though this is such a small sample, the results are still pretty incredible. If just one or two of the sisters became successful, then the whole hypothesis wouldn't really be able to stand up to scrutiny. But with results like these, even a small sample says a lot. I think it also worked out really well that all three kids they happened to have were female because chess was, again, very much considered a man's game. And a lot of professional players were convinced that women just couldn't compete at the same level. It's almost like this made the results so much stronger because, as far as everyone was concerned, Laszlo was starting at a disadvantage. Not only did he have to be consistent enough to produce three high-ranked chess players, but they all also happened to be genetically inadequate at the start, so to speak. So if nothing else, this study shows that the most likely reason you see certain groups excel at certain cognitive tasks isn't because these groups are genetically superior, but because these groups either have the subject more accessible to them at a younger age, or because they are encouraged to participate while some other groups are discouraged by being told that either this isn't for them or they'll never be good anyways. I think the latter is actually really important because it can create this self-fulfilling prophecy where the external biases that are placed on someone or a group end up affecting how they're able to progress. And now that I started rambling about this a bit more, I'm actually starting to feel like this result is way more important than I originally realized, which is all the more reasons why it might be beneficial if this study was more well known. When I was first reading all of this, I just thought like, oh, that's pretty neat. And I didn't really think what it means much past being able to teach your kid how to do things early on or impress your friends with your four-year-old's party tricks. But now I definitely realize that it plays a much more important role in both early childhood development and even leveling the playing field for all kids that are ranked against each other in school. Now, on the other side of the coin of this whole thing, I can't speak for anyone else, but I do find these results kind of encouraging for personal reasons. Mainly because I notice that when I look at things I can possibly pick up and learn, I definitely ask myself, is this something that I would be good at or is it not even worth trying? And there were more times than I would like to admit where I decided that I probably wouldn't be able to excel, so I just walked away and went with something different. And while sure, I'd probably learn things that relate to my existing skill set faster, now I feel like that the excuse of, I'm just not a natural, isn't as valid anymore, and those other things might actually be worth a shot. It just requires more time and dedication, and at least that's more of a choice than my genetic composition, so... At least it's up to me whether or not I become good at it more than whether I was built for it. And just to be clear, at no point did the finding from the study try to negate that there is such a thing as talent when it comes to certain activities. For anyone listening, if you've ever had to teach multiple people something, I'm sure you've noticed that some are going to pick it up a lot faster than others. Laszlo never said that this isn't the case at the end of his experiment. What he said was that given a person with innate talent and a person without... The one that's going to be the most successful is the one that puts the most effort into owning their skills. The innate talent is only relevant in the beginning, but in the long run, it's the effort that will provide the results. I guess the way that I think about that is a sprint versus a marathon. An innate ability is like the sprint. It will get you the furthest distance faster, but you will get a lot further if you're a long distance runner. All right, so my little conclusion now, right? One of the articles that I was reading while gathering all my information threw out some suggestions for why we might be putting more emphasis on quote-unquote born geniuses rather than individuals that had to put in hard work. The main culprit was brought up as the media and how it only shows people's accomplishments rather than explaining the process and the effort it took to get there. They used Elon Musk as one of the examples in how he gets talked about as a prodigy, but you rarely see it mentioned that he started learning how to program at the age of 10. So add up all the hours of practice from then until he hit the public's eye as an adult, and that's a lot of hours that went into developing his craft. So he probably wasn't born particularly smart, not to throw any shade at Elon Musk, but he just put a lot of effort and practice into what he was working on. I think that this is a fair point that the article makes, obviously, because even if these stories were to mention that the skills took a long time to develop, that would probably still get overshadowed by the main parts, which are the accomplishments, 
And the reader still wouldn't register hard work as something that plays a key role in the outcome. But personally, I don't think that the media can take all the blame for this one. I think the reason we've been shown stories of people who don't have to try really hard is because, well, they're just way more interesting to tell. I'll go back to Queen's Gambit on this one, just because that's what started this whole thing. Way more people will be interested in watching the show as it is now, or reading the book, whatever, where the main character only practices actual chess for 15 minutes a day, learns the rules of the game by passively watching from a distance, and then at night she uses her mind to project this big chessboard on the ceiling, and from memory replays the games from that day over and over until she finds the most optimal move to go back the next day and beat her opponent. Imagine if instead of that story, we watched one where the character didn't have an innate ability, and instead, she just had to learn chess in real time. So spending hours at the board and reading about opening moves and just doing them over and over and over and over and over. Stories that have these eccentric characters with this almost superpower-like gift are what's interesting. And because that's how it's presented to us in either fiction or if it's real life that it's sort of rewritten so that it fits this fictional ideal, the statistics in our head get skewed. And we start to think that if we want to be someone that gets stories written about them, we have to essentially be born great. And that's just not how that works. All right, that's enough for today, I think. I do really feel like I got way more bang for my buck with this story because when I first heard about it, I honestly thought there wouldn't be much more to it and that I would just be talking about three really good chess players. But this was just a roller coaster from start to finish. Since this episode is more of a fun story and history rather than heavy scientific research, I'm not going to include all of the sources like I usually do. But I'll just include one or two links that I think some of the general story the best and call that a day. That way, in case any of you do want to read them, you can just read one or two articles rather than having to dig through like 15 links looking for random bullet points of interest. Trust me, I'm doing this for you. All right, thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in a week or two. I don't know, who knows. Bye!